The goal of this statistical review for test theory is just as a refresher for some of the topics for an in, from an introductory to stats course. Also, it can be used as some review uh, for those that may be taking a second course in statistics, as well as uh, a refresher at certain points in a research methods or introductory to stats course. But it is not intended as a standalone. It is a supplement to the course and a supplement to the readings. So we consider two areas of statistics, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. In descriptive statistics, you should have learned that we we're organizing through collecting and classifying data. We summarize data through tables, graphs, and frequency distributions. And we describe, that is, we present and communicate findings. For inferential statistics, we want to generalize about a population based on a sample. We're going to test a hypothesis. So we draw from a sample a conclusion to the population. And how we sample is important. Whether it's based on random sampling or available sampling can impact what we are able to say about the population and how far it will generalize to other populations. Statistics as well deal with univariate versus multivariate statistics. In considering the distinction between these two, we are typically talking about the dependent variable. We have a population, and from that population, one can draw a sample. Well, a population is simply a complete set. It's all of the members of a group we care about. And a sample is a subset, or a selected subgroup. Populations have parameters. These parameters are measured characteristics or an index of a population. And samples have a statistic or statistics. They are measured characteristics or an index of a sample. So we can consider parameters are measures of a population and statistics are measures of a sample. Let's consider test scores. Test scores we can think of as a variable, and testing we can think of as, as a system of variables and constants. So a constant, if you recall, is a characteristic which everyone has the same value. It's the same for each person. So if we are examining 7th grade students in a school on a test, well, 7th grade is a constant for all of those certain students by definition. Whereas a variable can take on different values and different characteristics. They can be qualitative or quantitative. So, for example, we could be talking about gender or eye color as qualitative, or we could be talking about quantitative test scores. We have both continuous values, which can take on any value in a range, and discrete scores, which are typically thought of as countable uh, and limited in quantity. When we are considering only observed test scores, such as the case, for example, with, let's say, 30 students taking a six-point quiz, discrete and limited values occur if we can take on only the values of, let's say, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, uh, assuming there's no partial credit. Even though there may be theory under underneath that there's uh, a true uh, continuous measure, also, consider the fact that we have a finite population uh, of interest here, that they're seventh graders, and off, which is often the case if, if you consider testing. And although you would want to extrapolate out potentially to other groups, if you are drawing all of your samples from seventh graders, this is the population of interest. Our variables, the data that we're actually collecting, this can be different for each subject. We have to consider what we want to collect when conducting some form of testing or research. So for example, we may want to conduct information about race or gender, socioeconomic status, test scores, uh, number of children in a family, time or distance, weight or height. These things we tend to measure directly 
maybe build a composite out of it. We also have this idea of latent variables or constructs. For example, happiness as you see the smile. This is unobservable. That is, we can observe and build operational definitions as discussed in a different video, but eventually we need to measure something. So for in this little example with our smiley face, we might measure the size of an eye, how wide open it is. We might measure angles of a smile or the brow itself. And we might say those are observable measures or variables of an underlying concept of happiness, which we cannot measure. So we take the observables and we measure the unobservables. Here is an example of a composite of what the unobserved test scores measures of X the smile might look like. And on the other side we have the true late trick. So considering our observable variables we could consider 30 students taking a quiz and how we might display that data. Here's a frequency table or distribution of data. So we have X as our variable, which is, could be a score on a quiz. We have frequency, F at X. We have cumulative frequency. And here we have proportion and cumulative proportion, which could also often be seen as percent or cumulative percent. So our scores in this case range from 0 to 6. The frequency is the number of students uh, getting or earning each score. So for example, we can look across at the score of four and see that seven students scored that value. Our cumulative frequency is the point at which you're below. Uh, students have that score. So we can look at the score of three, look across to the cumulative frequency and see 19 students had that score. We could also add up the values for frequencies at or below that three. So nine, five, four, and one equal 19. Uh, we can take a peek at the fourth column for proportion, sometimes, as I said, seen as percent. This is uh, a relative frequency. This is the proportion who earned a given value of three. So uh, 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 a given value. So we can see for 3.3 3 or 30 percent scored that value. The cumulative proportion is we see as CP, we can think of that uh, as the percent that's sort of linked to the cumulative frequency. And we can say that, for example, for a score of 5, 97% or 0.97, the proportion, scored at or below that value. This is a histogram which displays data and is a visual means of inspecting the distribution. It can be used to measure central tendency and variability. This is a distribution of the data we just saw. We can see that 3 is the most common very easily uh, from a mode perspective, which I'll go over in a second. And we can see that scores range from 0 to 6. Measures of central tendency. The average or typical value in a set of data, we can think of the three M's, mode, median, and mean. I will discuss them further, but mode is the most, median is the middle, and mean, well, that's our average. The mode is the most frequent scoring distribution. When we have one mode, it's unimodal. Two modes, it's bimodal or multimodal. When you have many modes, it's multimodal beyond two. We can see in our previous data set in the background that we had a unimodal distribution. The median or the middle score, this is uh, the physical middle of our data. So we can think if we were to arrange everything in a row out by each individual person, we can look at where the middle score is or the 50% scores. We can think of this as P of 50 or 50% 50 of scores fall at or below this value. It's a percentile of 50. So this is the middle. We can see in our distribution again, if we were to string all these out, that the middle scores would be a combination of the two threes that we see in the middle here. And we could take the average of those three. The mean is the weighted mean, the arithmetic mean, the number average of the scores in the distribution, the numerical average of the scores in the distribution. Basically, you just add up all your values of x and divide by x. 
for a population, we see mu is the parameter. And for a sample, we see x bar, x with that little bar over top, is the mean for a sample, a statistic. In the background, we can again see our data set. We can take all of those scores, 0, 1, 1, 1, etc., all the way through 6, sum them up, they equal 90, divide by the number of cases, which is 30 in this case, and we get the value of 3. The summation operator, we see an uppercase sigma, the Greek letter, i equals 1. In this case, we're starting at i equals 1, just means we're starting at the very beginning, the first person, the first object or event. And going through n, n is the total number of events. So we're going to sum from 1 to n, and we're going to sum across x. So we see i equals 1, put a 1 there, n equals, in this case, for our previous example, 30. We're going to take all those values and sum them together. That is our summation operator. So we take x1, x2, x3, etc., all 30. Here is another example uh, of a distribution, and we will talk about symmetrical distributions and skewed distributions. Here's a symmetrical distribution. One of the ideas I'd like you to take away here is that when a uh, distribution is truly symmetrical, the mean, median, and mode are all in the same location. When they're not symmetrical, we have a skew. In this case, we have a positive skewed distribution at the top, and we can see that the most impacted is the mean, then the median, then the mode. That tail is skewed all the way to the right. When we skew to the left, we see that the mean, median pull out further to that direction to the left to the negative skew. Measures of variability. We want to summarize the spread of our observations. We have scatter in our data. We can consider some measures like the range, the variance, and the standard deviation. The range is very basic. It's the difference between the lowest and highest scores. Uh, not very informative and can sometimes be misleading if that's all you knew. So in our previous example, our range, people scored a 0 and people scored a 6. We have a range from 0 to 6, um, in this case 6. Uh, but it doesn't really help us in much detail. It's not much more useful beyond that, as you probably learned. The variance and standard deviation are at the heart of uh, variability. Here's a raw score formula for variance. Very useful in trying to understand it. Uh, this, again, this is just a recap, but it's the average squared deviations of measures around their mean. Well, what does that mean? Well, we can see that we have in the numerator, if you take what's in between the parentheses, you have x uh, sub i minus mu, or x sub i minus x bar. Effectively, that's a deviation score. But we're going to say how far on average are people or persons or objects from the mean. Let's take if we have an example with data points of 2, 3, 5, and 6, we can see that for each one of these scores, we're going to subtract it from the mean. So for the first one, we take 2 minus 4. The average of 2, 3, 5, and 6 is 4. So we take 2 minus that average and we square it. We do that for each one of those values, and we divide it by m minus 1. That is all there is to the calculation of variance. There's other ways to calculate variance. The other ways to calculate variance, we'll see the computational method in a second. First, here's the standard deviation. All we have to do is take the square root of our variance to calculate. In this case, our 3.33 for, for variance for a sample, that s, is square, uh, take the square root, and we come up to 1.82. We'll use that in an example, but really we'll round that up to 2 for simplicity for this example here. The computational formula is very easy to use relative to the deviation formula, the raw score formula. But the raw score formula will be very useful when we get into concepts of analysis of variance, or even just kind of knowing what is going on with the data. That is, understanding variance as a measure of deviation, how far away values are on average from uh, the mean. So the standard deviation is really that, that measure. Here we see a computational formula. Very useful if you're doing hand calculations, but for most of us, uh, we may do a couple example hand calculations on a, in a classroom setting or a test, but for the most part, we'd be using uh, software like SAS or SPSS or R. We can use central tendency and variability to help us describe how scores relate to each other. So we can consider the deviation score. 
that which is at the heart of that variance measure and standard deviation. How far away in raw score units here in this case is a measure from the mean? In this case, we're just going to take and use a mean of four, and we're going to call the standard deviation to uh, later on, just for simplicity, even though we knew it wasn't precisely the value we calculated earlier. So a deviation score is simply x minus x bar. So if we have the value of 2 and the mean is 4, we're at negative 2. We're negative 2 units away from that 4. 2 is minus, is 2 units smaller than a 4. And, and a 5 is 1 unit greater than 4. That's a deviation score. If you understand deviation scores, z scores, which should be a refresher, should become relatively easy to you. We're just going to take those deviation scores and divide them by the standard deviation. We're creating a standardized measure of a deviation score. So now we take each one of those deviation scores, and as I said before, now we're just going to say that the standard deviation is 2 for simplicity. We take and divide each one of those values. So we're going to replace our deviation with z-scores, and we can see that minus 2 divided by 2 equals negative 1. And subsequently, we come up with negative 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 1. These, this is the calculation of a z-score and should also be revealed. Percentiles and percentile ranks, we won't go into all the calculations here. But I just want to refresh your memory that percentiles are a score at or below which a given percentage of individuals fall, whereas the percentile rank is the percentage of cases falling at or below a given point. So as an example, we can see this, this chart, this ogive chart, where across the bottom we have a score. So for example, we could look at 50.5, and we could go up that to, to where the ogive is, uh, meets um, the percent on the distribution, and go across. So from score to percent, we can look across and see that we have a value of approximately 20%. could also go across a value, let's say 80%, and go down and see that it's probably somewhere approximately a score of 82. The normal distribution is a family of distributions. They're a very happy family. They are the normal curve. Uh, some of you may have heard that before. Uh, Carl Gauss um, is attributed to creating this distribution. Uh, what we're really seeing on the left-hand side is the value Px. It's just the height of the curve. And we're using those measures. Uh, the measures typically we're plugging in means and standard deviations or variances to create the curve itself. X is just a score, so we could think of like a test score or something. Mu in this case is the mean, and that uh, lowercase sigma there we see is the standard deviation. Here's a typical normal distribution, the standard normal distribution, the mean is 0, the standard deviation is 1. We can see the percents associated with them. Between 0 and 1 is 34.1 percent. Between 1 and 2, positive, positive 1 and positive 2, we see the values of 13.6 percent fall at or below that point in the curve. Some quick comments as a refresher, this is positive to negative infinity. We have the bell shape, it's symmetrical. There's one mode. We can look at points of inflection on either side will be the same in opposite directions. Uh, it's, asymptot it's asymptotic, which just means it never actually touches that x-axis. The total area under that curve into infinity in both directions is 1. Uh, for the standard normal, dis uh, normal distribution, we have uh, z-scores effectively. Means of 0, standard deviations of 1. And... Uh, we often use this in testing, both in test uh, theory and also in testing statistics. Measures of association. Typically, we will think about things like uh, relationships between two variables. Uh, in testing, we sometimes want to know how much of our observed or manifest var variables relate to constructs or latent variables. So we may have one. Uh, the smiley face, and then as our underlying concept of happiness, and we can see that manifestly it's broken up, but well enough understood that it relates to that underlying idea. So let's consider some issues with the variables and relationships. We want to know how are scores related? Are they low to low values, low to high, low to high? Is there no relationship? How do, do we? How do deviation scores relate effectively? is what we're thinking of when we consider uh, things like correlation.
So here's just a characteristic of a correlation. We can consider plotting axes and y's on a coordinate plane. Uh, in this case, let's demonstrate below is a linear relationship uh, with a constant rate of change. Actually, a perfect relationship. You never really see these in real life. Uh, you tend to see some deviation, whether it's measurement error or random fluctuation. So we have two related variables. We can also have issues in bivariate correlations of direction and magnitude. Direction we can think of as uh, a positive or negative direction. So from the lower left to the upper right for hours of study, it's positive, whereas upper left to lower right for times watching TV is a negative relationship. And the magnitude or size of uh, correlation uh, will range from 0 to 1. So overall, we can have values of positive 1 to negative 1. Nonlinear relationships occur all the time. Uh, we see this in signal detection theory. When we get into IRT, we'll work with logistic models. And this primer one, I won't discuss this in great detail. But just be aware that uh, the easiest way to detect these types of nonlinear relationships is simply to plot the data. Covariance should look a lot like our variance, but instead of just squaring the deviation of x minus x bar, we're going to multiply that by the deviation in the y scores. That's our covariance, how two variables covary together. We can see that covariances here look different. We have covariance around 15 and one around 185. We see that height in the first data set is in feet and weight is in pounds, and in the second one we see height in inches and weight again in pounds. Weight has the same standard deviation in both cases, around 31. But height changes. Covariance is dependent upon the size of the metric. So in order to get around this, we standardize covariance. Effectively, the correlations, which we were just talking about, are like standardized covariances. We divide the covariance by the standard deviation of each variable. We create what we call a unis, unitless measure of association. Here we have rho uh, r sub xy or, or rho sub. Here's different ways of calculating. You know, all the way on the left hand side we see r, but effectively all r is is the covariance of xy over the standard deviation of x times the standard deviation of y. It has three pieces. For more on this, you can see a different type of video or, or coursework. But this just gives you three different ways to break out our coefficient. We can see that on the, when we're in the middle, we see uh, next over. Uh, we see the covariance on the top, x minus x bar, y mi minus y bar divided by n minus 1. And then we can finally see that through a little bit of algebra, we can remove those n minus 1s and get the covariance effectively divided by standard deviations. This is a long method of doing it, but I, sometimes it's helpful if you're kind of getting to recap that you can see in the numerator of that equation the covariance, and you can see the two standard deviations in the denominator. So more specifically, this is the covariance. In the bottom, we have two standard deviations, the standard deviation of y, the standard deviation of x. And if we want to, as I showed before, we can remove the n minus ones to get our correlate, calculate correlate. Here's the raw score method for calculating how uh, some of our values. I'll show you this for the standard deviations and covariances. I'm not going to go through this in great detail. Uh, feel free to pit pause and go through the mathematics. We're calculating here sums of squares uh, and deviation scores. We have deviation of x minus x bar times deviation of y minus y bar. In this case, minus 2 times minus 3 for that first uh, number of studied hours in x. We can see if we square those two values, negative 2 and negative 3, we end up with a 4 and 9. Then we can sum down each row. Do that operation and summing down each row. We can take and take the square root of x minus x bar squared, quantity squared, and get the value of 5.9. Do the same thing for the y's and get the value of 6.16. Take those two things and get the cross product, cross multiply. Effectively, we're going to get the denominator of our covariance, of our correlation. 
So we just previously got the denominator of the correlation. The numerator, in this case, when we've, we've gotten rid of our n minus 1s, uh, the numerator is just going to be the value of 29. So we can take 29 divided by 31 and we get 0.92. Again, this is another example uh, using some of the available data. Uh, please feel free to pause these and go through some of the math. In this case, we can just simply take and know that it's covariance is over the two standard deviations multiplied. So we can take that covariance of 15.429, and in this case, for that first set of data, height and weight, multiply 0.52 times 30.9. Covariances, standard deviations. We can do the same thing for the second set of data, which is really the same set of data with the transformation from feet to inches and we see that the correlation is the same value. Computing the correlation, the least you need to know, here's a good example of covariance over standard deviations, or you can calculate it directly from multiplying, cross-multiplying the summation of z-scores divided by... The Pearson correlation, variables of interest, x and y, we have to have quantitative continuous measures. Typically, that's interval or ratio. You'll sometimes see people try to do this with ordinal types of data. There's other measures we can talk about for rank order, for like Spearman, et cetera. Uh, just review this in your uh, introductory text. But uh, for now, just the heart of it is a Pearson correlation uh, R. So R sub XY is really only appropriate when we have linear measures. As I mentioned before, sometimes we have nonlinear measures. Uh, one of the easiest ways is to draw or <laughs> calculate a scatter plot of some form and examine the relationship between x and y. Correlation just shows the relationships between the data. Causation is logically thought out. Often we can think of this in the sense of time. Uh, is some one of the easier concepts to think about causation. I won't go into this in this short video. Uh, correlations are underestimated when we have curve, uh, curvilinear relationship. We're going to underestimate the degree of association. And, but we can often transform things with maybe some form of function, like a square root function or, or squaring values, attempting to account for and, and transforming the data. Additional measures of association, I, I already mentioned the Spearman's row as, as an ordinal measure for correlations, but for nominal, we often use contingency tables, uh, the fee correlation, uh, even you know, chi-square issues. You know, you have ordinal data, you have Spearman's row, Kendall's tau, polycourt correlations, uh, tetracourt correlations. For dichotomous and continuous, we often hear the point by serial or by serial. Uh, point by serial is when there's real uh, by, by serial data, and artificial is when we've actually created uh, a, a by serial relationship. We will often want to predict performance. We might want to say that ability or quiz test quizzes or something in the classroom is predictive of a final test. We might want to say tests are predictive of ability in uh, another grade. So based on this, we can use one of the versions of prediction as a regression. So just as recap, regression, we have a coefficient of termination. Basically, think about squaring that R value. So this is the square of the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient in the simplest regression context. And we can interpret this as the portion of variance in Y, which can be explained or accounted for by the variance in X. How much does Y move when X moves? So when things are one, uh, near one, we have a good ability to predict. And when they're near zero, we have next to no ability to predict, at least in a linear sense. This is regression and prediction. And we can think of this as how strong is that relationship. The regression line is created when we take A, which we can consider intercept, and B, the slope. And for each person, we recalculate a value. We'll get a predicted value of y. So with the regression line we also get this concept of error. How far away is a real score from a predicted score? We assume that these errors uh, are or, or residuals as we sometimes call them for all persons across all persons on average is going to be equal to zero. Uh, but basically we're finding a, a line that we hope 
can help us predict real values. Finding the regression equation, well, we choose a line to minimize those squared residual values. So we take y minus the predicted y value, square those values, and sum them together. Whatever minimizes that value, whatever minimizes that, is the line of best value. So the least squares criterion, we can kind of see here as an example, we're trying to minimize the sum of squares of these vertical deviations. So if we take that first point uh, that's below the, the, the line, and the next one above, and the next one below, the next one above, we're just trying to find a line that will fit in between all of those, or amongst all of those, that minimizes all of those uh, vertical the standard error of estimate of y on x is the standard errors could be thinking about like the standard deviation of y given that we have an x score. Uh, this is a variance of predicted y around uh, actual y's. So we can take that summation of y minus y bar uh, quantity squared and, and divide by m minus 2. And effectively, that should look very familiar in the sense of a variance formula. It should also be familiar from your previous stats course. So here we have the computational, uh, the raw score. Another formula we can use to calculate out the standard error of estimate is a computational formula, which only relies on sample size standard deviations and correlations. Uh, if you remove the n minus 1 and n minus 2 for very, very large samples, we see that we're basically uh, calculating out variance times uh, 1 minus the uh, correlation squared, uh, which we know uh, from our previous examples to be the coefficient of determination. And we can kind of think about this as if we're taking 1 minus the coefficient of determination then we're really thinking about uh, what's left when things don't fit. So times the variance. So this ends up uh, can become a large value based on the size of your standard deviation, but it does help us understand how far away we are in terms of y uh, from predict, you know, in terms of predicted values of y from actual values of y. I'm going to end this little introduction, at least this section over here, uh, and may post other uh, stats videos later on.